touted as one of the best drummers of the 20th century, Vinnie Colaiuta is an exceptionally technical and versatile drummer. He's collaborated with some of the biggest names in music across a series of decades and genres and has a ridiculously long credit list. Born in Pennsylvania, Colaiuta started drumming at age seven and took to the instrument like a bee to honey. In this great interview with Dom Famularo, he highlights his early influences as well as his decisiveness in wanting to pursue drums. You know, I, I went into the band director's office and, and, and I said, hi, I want to take drum lessons. So he sat me down and I came out of there, I don't know, 15 minutes later, 30 minutes later, completely changed. Mm. It was like my first epiphany light bulb moment. Beautiful. And I walked out of there and literally said, this is what I'm going to do. Beautiful. I'm not looking back. There was not going to be a plan B or plan C for me. There was only that laser beam of, I'm going to do this, period. That's it. After I started studying, everything happened really quickly, like, like, a, like a tidal wave. I'm practicing and I'm progressing quickly and I'm absorbing a lot of information and constantly practicing. We were playing Buddy Rich charts and I got exposed to Buddy and I'd go see Buddy play. And I remember the stage band that I was in went to some inter-band camp, a tri-state area, and we went to one of these things. I met a very talented young drummer in a band from another school. He said to me, who's your favorite drummer? So I said, uh, my favorite drummer is Buddy Rich. But he, I said to him in response, who's your favorite drummer? And he just said, Tony Williams. Oh my gosh. And I'm thinking, oh, I said, who's that? You know, I didn't know, and he told me. Like so many other budding drummers of that era, Buddy Rich, Tony Williams and Billy Cobham were reference points when it came to learning the drums. After a period living and playing in Boston, he moved to California and performed in jazz clubs. It was here that he got his first big break playing with Frank Zappa. There I was in this huge soundstage that was like an airplane hangar. Yeah. And I stood in line and, and, and I saw people go up there one after the other and it was kind of brutal. Uh, one guy went up and started playing the guitar and in 15 seconds he got on the mic and said next oh, man, and it was like next tough. next next and so I'm getting closer to the front of the line <laughs> and now I'm starting to sweat and it was literally like you know it was like a laundry list of categorical things like okay let's test your memory phrase retention spit this back at me okay now I want you to play in 21 okay now solo in 19, okay, now we're gonna test your sight reading, you know? And then he put the black page down and I, and I looked away and started playing it from memory <laughs> as he was putting it on the page. And he thought, oh, you think you're a smart aleck. Right? He takes it off, puts something called Pedro's Dowry down, which was this long orchestral piece, and said three, four, and I had to play it in unison with Ed Mann, so I'm trying to read this thing. And, and then he just stopped and said, come over here, pulled me to the side of the stage, and in his almost exact words, he looked at me very deadpan and said, I'd be amazed right now if anybody could come up here and cut you. But out of respect, I have to listen to a few more people. Can you please go and wait over there? <laughs> Maybe 15 minutes later, the manager comes over to us and says, oh, well, Mr. Zappa would like to hire you. When can you start? Oh my gosh. And I said, now. <laughs> One of the first things that Zappa allegedly said to Colaiuta once he had joined the group was to subscribe to Offbeat. There's a button down there, don't disappoint Zappa. Taking over from the virtuosic Terry Bozio was no easy feat. For more on this fantastic drummer, you can check out my video essay on him in the top right hand corner now. But Colaiuta did an outstanding job. The first Zappa album he appeared on, Joe's Garage, was a three part rock opera with a runtime of nearly two hours. Zappa's direction and compositions formed a vast canvas which allowed Colaiuta to showcase his versatility and technique. Two tracks that capture the breadth of Colaiuta's palette are Keep It Greasy, a manic driving cut that's a stark contrast to one of my favorite Zappa compositions, Watermelon in Easter Hay, a dreamy extended guitar solo that's been hailed as one of Zappa's best. Colaiuta's speed, dexterity, and energy in the former and his soulful feel and weight in the latter underpin why he's so often described as chameleonic by fans. <laughs> Dom
Don't forget to subscribe if you're enjoying the video. If you want to leave me a little tip, you can do so by clicking the thanks button down below. And if you want to become an official member of the channel with fun, exclusive perks, you can just hit join. Kolayuta didn't stay with Zappa for too long. In the early 80s, he made the choice to become a studio musician for the rest of his career, a decision which opened him up to a world of different styles and musicians. Before diving into examples of the many credits he amassed in his time as a session musician, I think it's worth checking out this clip first. I wanted to do studio work because I was influenced by studio players as well, and I thought that I, I would be able to do a lot of different things and document music, and it, it seemed and be able to work in town. Yeah. You know, studio time costs X amount of money. Right. All these musicians are in the room at the same time. And, okay, the red light's on, we're kind of get off, and there was an arranger, and the charts were there, and you had to read, and you really, there's really no room for error here, because time is money. So what it trained me to do was, it trained me to have my skill set work for me immediately as soon as the red light went on meaning that i had to figure out how to interpret the music and read and execute it at the same time instantly yeah i got trained to do it by being in situations where i knew i had to get it right because time is money yeah. it, it was it was like a discipline the nature of studio recording in that period only helped Kolyuta hone his craft. As he mentioned, time is money and he was ultimately there in a professional capacity to deliver the best results in the shortest amount of time. And doing that over and over again helped to cement his reputation as a top tier session drummer, which in turn helped him to find more jobs. So with that in mind, a big part of the 80s for Kolyuta was recording with Joni Mitchell in the studio on three albums, but also during various tours. For the rest of the decade, he also garnered credits with Leonard Cohen, Barbara Streisand and the Beach Boys, among others. The 90s saw Kola Yuta continue to dabble in new styles as he worked with John McLaughlin, Salim Dion, Duran Duran and began a notable collaboration with Sting. Of 1994 saw the drummer release his first solo album, a jazz fusion record that features Herbie Hancock, Sting, Chick Corea and John Petitucci among others. This record wasn't only a means for Kolayuta to exercise his compositional talents but also to write music tailored for him and his style. This section from the opening track highlights his trademark energy and technique. Moving into the noughties and 2010s, Kolayuta's credits went to another level of ridiculous variety as he played with Queen Latifah, The Pizzicat Dolls, Megadeth, The Weeknd and Michael Bublé. As mentioned earlier, his exposure over time to countless different studios and styles meant he was able to build an expansive musical vocabulary, which allowed him to transition seamlessly between genres. He touches on this in an interview with Sweetwater. My whole thing is just to get into the whole character of it. Okay. The whole, what is it about? Much more so than saying, well, this is the kind of pattern that you play. Because then if you, I feel that if you do it that way, then you have to find a home for those patterns and you have to figure out why you're learning a pattern. I think if you can kind of get inside the concept and open yourself up to what that music is saying to you, then the other things will follow. Some people think it's like being like an actor or I've been called a chameleon, but really I just, all I do is just kind of listen to it and immerse myself in it and say, well, okay, what, what are you telling me? Let me just, it's like stepping inside of a picture. Sure. You know what I mean? And you step inside and you go, well, it's kind of cold, I need a coat. You know, uh, it's raining, I, I need an umbrella, you know, and, and 
It really is that. I think this also feeds into an often praised aspect of Crowley's playing, his timing. I don't mean just feel, I mean odd time signatures, metric modulation, beat displacement, and more. Playing with artists such as Zappa, Jeff Beck, and John McLaughlin meant Kolyuta had to be able to play some really challenging music, but what's impressive is that he played it so effortlessly. If we go back to Keep It Greasy from the first record he did with Zappa, there's this verse section with a crazy time signature and groove that he executes so naturally. Koliuta's early years dedicated to rigorous technique equipped him with a musical language that gave his playing unique spirit and spontaneity. In this interview, he mentions how he had to stop modeling his playing on his drumming heroes and find his own style. I, like many, went through modeling phases, but I realized the, the danger of, of getting stuck in modeling someone. Right, right, right. And I got really into Billy, which a lot of people did. God, man, everybody did. Everybody sure. did, yeah, yeah. rightfully so. Myself, I was there, yeah. But I, it was hard for me to stop emulating that, and, and I had to make an effort to stop emulating that. And, and then I realized at one point, I thought, well, who am I? And how am I going to be whoever that's going to be? Great question. One day, I just went, I have to stop chasing it. And all of a sudden, I emerged. And I don't know what it was or is, <laughs> but people would tell me. And you know what? At the end of the day, all I have is me. So why am I running away from that? I think the next step after finding your voice is allowing it to organically take form in your playing with little to no inhibitors. When speaking to Rick Beato, he comes out with this great phrase, thought is the enemy of flow. I have this mantra, thought is the enemy of flow. And, Love that. and I think that, that really, you, you really can't be fully present in the moment, especially in an improvisatory sense. Yes. If, if you're thinking even for a second, yeah. a nanosecond, just isn't going to happen. So you're shooting yourself in the foot. And so when, then when you, you, you overcome that and you, you don't succumb to that sort of, I'm going to think now, I'm going to think now, and you're just in flow, everything takes care of itself. You know, and as it should be. Vinny Colaiuta's contributions to music earned him a place in the Modern Drama Hall of Fame in 1996, and his work will no doubt be remembered and studied for a long time to come. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment, and I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you.